Conley. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Lilith Center. And today we're really excited to be joined by, sorry, Wakanini Sebastian Kamau. Um, Sebastian is a PhD candidate at MIT in the Media Arts and Sciences program. And he's a synthetic biologist and writer who's research concerns emerging biotechnology. So tonight he's going to share a little bit more of his research with us um, as it relates to our current exhibition, Symbionts, which is now on view, and in particular the work of Pierre Huy, um, his work entitled Spiders. So as many of you maybe know, this series kind of points out where art and research are overlapping on MIT's campus, so we hope you enjoy. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Sebastian. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you all for coming. Also want to give a shout out to Tom on AV. Um, and I want to start things off by having a land acknowledgement. Uh, the work that I do for my research work um, and the gallery that we're currently in is on the unceded ancestral lands of the Wampadog Nation and of the Massachusetts people. Um, the reason I like to start my talks off with a uh, land acknowledgement is because I'm a synthetic biologist interested and maybe a little too bold in thinking that the work that I do might be able to engineer an entire environment, an entire ecology. Um, and these are the lands that are, have been historically uh, stewarded by native and indigenous peoples. So. Uh, the piece that I want to talk to you guys about and how it relates to my research is a uh, spider by Pierre Huey, who you maybe have seen some elements of the of his work here. There's a spider there. There's another one here. And in total, there were 20 spiders that were originally released into this gallery. Um, they were sourced from a biological supply company. And originally, there was a corner cordoned off to allow them to initially build uh, their web. But other than that, they've been left to roam this room. And if you read the didactic that's on the wall, Pierre wants to use a spider not as an object of fear or disgust, as it typically is in media, but as instead a way to highlight that we are always in community with other species around us. Um, and it's true that spiders were brought into this exhibit, but it's probably also true that this building has had spiders for a long while. And if you're in the media lab past a certain hour uh, and you go up to any of the floors, you might see other organisms that scurry around. I work on mice, so I tend to notice where they are. Um, all right, so the cellar spider, um, which may or may not be in fact a spider. It's a, it's a catch all term for daddy long legs, like organisms. Um, uh, recently learned that they're not technically spiders because their abdomens perhaps fuse to the rest of their thorax, which might be a clinical definition. Um, but they are, I also recall uh, a rumor that I remember hearing as a child that cellar spiders were the most deadly spider because they had the most dangerous venom. Uh, perhaps you have heard of this one too. The, the reason that uh, they're benign to us is because, at least it was, as it was told to me, they, they don't have the ability to pierce our skin. Um, this isn't true, uh, but there is an element that could be a, re a rationale for why there is, there has been uh, uh, some hesitation amongst people with being around spiders, and that's because the cellar spider likes to eat other things. It likes to eat other spiders, and that is a characteristic that makes it, to some, not a nuisance. It's providing potentially an ecological role that benefits us. Um, and so maybe the cellar spider being in this room is actually doing us all a big favor. Um, and Trenton look at it with disgust, but maybe with admiration. But there are other critters that we are living with that we don't have as mutualistic a relationship with. I mean, surely we're giving the spider a safe place, warmth. Um, they're from and originally native to uh, portions of South and Latin America. Um, but we have brought them here as we've brought many other species to wherever we go. Um, and as I mentioned, 
most likely perfectly benign. But right, there are other species that we have conflicts with. These are other invertebrates, and I'm gonna start talking about invertebrates and get to the vertebrates later on. But the invertebrates like the mosquitoes and other flies that might be responsible for the large plurality, a uh, good portion of vector-borne diseases. These are things like Zika, chikungunya, uh, dengue, that, and malaria that are endemic in many, unfortunately, many places of the world. So how do we manage our interrelatedness, our co-occupying of the same space with these other organisms that cause us health issues or concerns? So this has been a challenge for as long as we've been here and as long as they've been here and living together, but in the past 100 or so years, we've developed a variety of technologies that we use to manage their spread and their population sizes. Uh, this has looked like developing chemicals, pesticides, that we use to kill them. Um, in the 50s, end of the, end of the World War II, end of the 40s, start of the 50s, there was a large scale project in the United States to figure out how to deal with the kinds of mosquitoes that are responsible for causing malaria. Um, malaria still kills you know, on the order of 400,000 people a year. Um, but here in the States, we're fortunate that we don't have to think about whether or not we have a bed net over our bed every night. And that's because the US government had a program where they liberally applied um, chemicals like DDT uh, into the irrigation ditches, standing water, fields that might be habitats for the mosquitoes. And as a result, they crashed the populations here at least in, in, in the States. At the same time, just a little bit, a little bit later, uh, there were concerns being raised about what was the effect of using these large, broad-scale pesticides to deal with this problem. It's using a blunt hammer to deal with what is a very small, small nail. Um, and this was popularized in the book Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. Um, beautiful book if you have had a chance to read it and highly suggest it if, if you haven't, where it talks about the dangers of DDT. Um, one of maybe the most canonical examples of the threat that DDT plays in the ecology of ecosystems, at least here in the States, was that at the same time that these pesticides were being more and more used, started noticing that a lot of other species were starting to go down in size. So things like the bald eagle. It turned out that as a downstream result of this liberal use of these broad spectrum pesticides, we started to realize that the shells of bald eagles were getting thinner. Um, and because they were getting thinner, not enough of the hatchlings were able to survive and reach maturity in adulthood. And this struck at the national symbol of the United States and you know, raised a lot, of, a lot of public support for coming up with other ways of dealing with pests. Okay, now if you do read Silent Spring, uh, towards the end, Rachel Carson refers to potentially forms of biocides that don't rely on using chemicals, but in instead use biotic life as a way to manage other biotic life. So this was taken with and run with uh, a technique that is another way we've dealt with mosquitoes and other invertebrates in the past, and that's the sterile insect technique. And this technique, which is how we got rid of the neuroarchan screwworm here in the States, was we rear a lot of males, and then we irradiate them so that they have non-viable sperm, and then release them. And if you release on the order of 10 times the amount of males in a given population, you have enough of a reduction in fertility that the population crashes. This is costly, um, but it does work um, if you have the means to scale a project like that. But there have been, in the last 10 or 20 years, more research that's found that there are forms of symbionts that might be able to confer abilities that might be beneficial to us that aren't as drastic as, say, eradicating an entire species. So the symbiont that I'm thinking of is Wolbachia, which is a bacterium that is 
Um, and some estimates might be as present as in say 60 to 70% of the insect species that are in your backyard. But Wolbachia and the different strains of Wolbachia all have different characteristics. Um, some strains of Wolbachia, like the ones used by the World Mosquito Project, um, have this ability to block mosquitoes from transmitting some of the viruses or the pathogens that cause us harm. So the World Mosquito Program is primarily developing uh, control strategies and approaches that are for Oceania, uh, Asia, and South America, where there rear 80s Egypti mosquitoes that have been inoculated by this naturally occurring bacterium and this particular strain that doesn't cause uh, things like Zika and dengue and chikungunya to be passed on. There are other approaches that use other strains of Wolbachia that cause uh, the clutches, say if you had a male mosquito and the male mosquito had been infected with this particular strain of Wolbachia and you made it to a female mosquito, the resulting eggs don't hatch. And so we've got a sense now perhaps that there are different ways that we're dealing with uh, the vestiges of some of the kinds of international trade that have led us to get everywhere across the world, but have also caused us to um, bring a lot of genetic material organisms from different places to other places. And, and as a result, have made more of us more at risk for uh, different kinds of health threats. So we've got strategies that rely on using chemicals. We've got strategies that rely on using what seems to be this rather miraculous naturally occurring symbiont uh, to deal with this problem. But, right, I said I would start talking about invertebrates and then I'll talk about vertebrates. It's unfortunately not the case that there is a vertebrate analog to Wolbachia that we can readily use for dealing with things like the mice and rats who might be around here in Cambridge, might be in this building. So what do we do in those cases? And that's a bit of a harder problem. Now, if you've been following rodent news like uh, the past year or so, there's been greater and greater alarm about the threat that some of the newest classes of poisons have had on local wildlife. So in Massachusetts, even, uh, summer of 2021, we were able to get concrete pathological evidence that uh, two bald eagles, of which there are only 80 breeding pairs of bald eagles in Massachusetts, two bald eagles died as a result of ingesting rodenticide poisons. Sounds like it rhymes a bit of what happened when we started using broad spectrum pesticides in the past. There is always corollary, corollary threats to using these broad spectrum agents to deal with problems. Um, and for better or worse, the bald eagle has been able to be a through way for people to understand that these can affect non-target species. Um, so, all right, you don't have a nice symbiont to deal with vertebrate pests. Um, what do we do? Well, in the last 10 or so years, there's been an increase in the amount of tools, genetic tools that allow synthetic biologists like myself, the ability to engineer new traits, new genes into organisms. And that's what the plurality of my research work has been. It's been how can I engineer into the genome of mice the machinery that might do things like, say, bias the population of uh, a subset of mice to be more male than female, or maybe might do things like, say, reduce the fertility of female mice to begin with. Right, okay. Uh, I'm still not done with my PhD, so this is an ongoing project, process. Uh, but, you know, we've had the hindsight of the past 75, 80 years to realize that when scientists come up with what might be a potentially really cool tool, there might be downstream effects that didn't intend. So how do we as scientists try to hedge as best we can 
against some of those threats. I mean, the honesty is we can't be hubristic to believe that we can prevent ourselves from falling into all these traps, but perhaps there are some lessons we can learn to how we design and how we do science such that the next time we have or even this current crisis of what to do about, say, the large number of rats you see in Cambridge, is there a way that we can involve people in this process of figuring out a solution such that not only can we deal with it, but we can ensure that as best we can, we can get as many opinions about what we're doing to figure out what the best way going forward is. So, Right, there is now also the question of, well, how do, what, do you, what do you optimize for? Um, you've got a lot, of, a lot of variables here that you're trying to figure out what to deal with and how do you weight, weight all of them? I started this talk with the land acknowledgement and the understanding that the work that I do to engineer ecosystems uh, is on the na unceded native lands of nations that uh, were originally the stewards of them. So are there ways that we can engage these same communities from the inception of the project to figure out how we can design solutions that work with that in mind? Um, we have tried with limited success to engage native indigenous communities here in Massachusetts um, with our research work. Uh, and we're still figuring out the best practices for how to do that. At the same time, there are places where the threat of invasive mammals um, has very concretely affected the local, local flora and fauna of places where we have brought them to. So I'm thinking of primarily places like New Zealand. Um, New Zealand has a project called Predator Free 2050, where they have a goal of eradicating all of mammalian predators from the island islands, um, there are no native mammalian predators on, these, on those islands aside from bats. Um, but the mice, rats, goats, and stinks that we have brought to New Zealand have decimated many of the, say, flightless birds that don't have natural or defenses or know how to interact with this thing that wants to eat its eggs. So, right. There's another place that has a problem, and this problem is maybe more concretely affecting the kinds of interconnected life that people feel strongly about. How do we, how, how does an engineer like wrap that into the way that they're, that they're doing it? So we have had some success in talking with indigenous communities in, in New Zealand, and one of the large insights that we've gained is that there are, a variety of ways to think about what a species is. Um, there's the definition of a species that comes from perhaps a, a, a textbook you read in, in high school, that a species is anything that's able to mate successfully with another member of a kind of class, and that produces viable offspring. That's kind of the Western approach to what a species definition is. There's also the ecological species definition, where a species is not just defined by its particular set of genetic traits or characteristics or features, but also about the other kinds of critters that it is living with and around. And there's a term, fakapaba, which refers to genealogy that uh, Maori people use to refer to the interconnectedness, not only of themselves, um, but of all things to each other based on where they are. So how do we take a concept like fakapaba and integrate that into the genetic engineering design work that we're doing. So right, one of the pros of Wolbachia was that Wolbachia was naturally occurring and already existed, as I mentioned, 60 to 70% of the insect species that are around in your backyard. What are the kinds of symbionts, commensal bacteria, that might be living inside the microbiota of mice and rats? And it turns out that one of the foundational tools that modern gene genetic engineering relies on, that's uh, CRISPR, which is uh, kind of a molecular control F, 
like you would in a Word document, and cut. Um, turns out that there's a variant of this very helpful protein that exists in the same bacteria that exists in the microbiota of mice. So the challenge of coming up with a way to manage invasive pests without having to use pesticides is not only a matter of how can I, how can, how can we do it in a way that is durable, specific, uh, only targets what we intended to target, um, but it also needs to have a way to relate to the people who are going to be living with the introduction of whatever it is we make. That's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to to do something that might solve this problem. And it might mean that as a synthetic biologist, um, I have to take some approaches that are a little bit off the beating path. Now there are, there's this protein CRISPR that does this job of control assaying and cutting a particular part of the genome. But it turns out that it, that particular gene, as it comes from different organisms, has different capabilities, has different temperatures it works best at, has different uh, recognition sequences that it uses to find where in the genome it ought to go. Um, and the most characterized ones don't have any attention to where it, it is that they've come from. The original streptococcus, or the original CRISP, uh, CRISPR system was identified and used in mammalian cells, but it came from uh, Cephalococcus pyrogenes, which is a bacteria that is not, to my knowledge, uh, commensal to uh, anything that we would be working with. So the PhD is a long time, <laughs> uh, and it might be a little bit longer because trying to figure out a way to do it in such a way that respect not only the cultures that are living around the organisms that we are trying to uh, manage. But my also take longer because trying to think about what the ecosystem of the organisms that we find ourselves in, in communities with, how those relate to the cultures that we have. Uh, and in doing so, try to get at new ways and different ways of interacting with the world around us that start to dismantle the same kinds of hierarchical power structures that have led us to believe that we ought to be everywhere we are, and we need everything we have to be everywhere we are. Um, so again, this piece is about spiders, may or may not be spiders, um, but it's not about fear or disgust. It is about getting at how we live with others, and part of why I love bio art and why I'm so glad that my time here at MIT has overlapped with this exhibit is because there really is an emotional valence to emerging, bio, emerging technology, and particularly emerging biotechnology. And figuring out ways of engaging people with that might help us come up with new strategies, new approaches, new techniques, new thought patterns that inform how the science develops. Um, and with that, I wanna thank you all for coming, and I'll take any questions you might have.